Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Patrick Armstrong, CIO at Plurini, one of the world's finest investment houses. So uh, welcome, uh, Patrick. Hello, um, welcome. Um, now, uh, it, seems to be the, it seems to be the consensus view from most of sort of the, emer the um, uh, merchant banks and uh, investment banks that next year is going to be pretty tough sledging, a bit like this year. We're going to end on the S&P 500, roughly round about consensus of of 4,000, similar sort of levels as, as currently, um, sort of split between a sort of like a difficult first half and then a Fed pivot, and then it's going to sort of boost sentiment. But what's your sort of like view for equities in 2023? Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a tough year. I don't think there's going to be massive movement in the market. Um, I think it's actually pretty fairly priced right now, um, given the difficult situation, but better valuations than we entered the year in. Um, market's down 16% year to date. So um, valuations are more attractive than they were last year, but still very clear headwinds to equities. And um, it's a, a funny positioning right now where investor sentiment is extremely negative. So if you look at the association of individual investors, there's only 25% of investors are bullish right now as we exit the year. But if you look at analyst estimates for the S&P 500, they're forecasting profit margin of 13% for the S&P, um, which it would be a record high. And I just don't see companies generating margins that are record highs next year. I think the consumer is really going to be strained and uh, companies have had a great record of passing on higher prices to uh, consumers this year and saying, not our fault. We're not making margin on it. We're just passing on the costs, which isn't true because margins were really strong this year. But next year, I think that's the source of weakness. So I do think it's probably going to be a weak first half where companies guide lower. Probably the market doesn't sell off a lot, but uh, that probably sets the stage for a rally based on the very negative investor sentiment when they realize things aren't maybe going to be quite as bad as people are nervous about. Um, and that once the earnings estimates get to a level that'll be achievable, that probably sets a base under markets that leads to a second half rally, in my opinion. And are the bond markets correct compared to sort of what the Fed say? Because you've got Jerome Powell who's saying he's, he's not going to change, he's going to keep it high for longer and sort of not uh, cut interest rates at all um, in, in 2023. But obviously, you've got a really inverted um, yield curve at the moment. It's sort of historical levels, yeah. negative, 80, negative 80 basis points. But, but equally, you haven't got a sort of, you know, baked into markets a really hard recession because it seems as though the high yield junk bond spreads haven't yet blown out. So you've got this mild recession spooked in but you've got the bond market basically saying what you're doing Jerome Powell you know you're going to be cutting interest rates even though you say you're not what's your sort of view it's crazy I believe Jerome Powell I don't I think the bond market's wrong right. on this and uh, actually I think he's going to hike 50 basis points in December then another 50 basis points in the first quarter and then the economy is going to be slowing where it's flirting with a recession um, whether it falls into one or not I'm not sure I think it probably will fall into a mild recession the US is in a much better place than the rest of the world, um, economic wise, because of its strong um, job market. Basically, there's 1.7 job openings for every unemployed person in America. So anyone who wants to work can work right now. And um, a US consumer who's fully employed, um, getting pay rises, that really sets the stage for reasonable economic growth. It basically stops the most negative scenarios until there is something that really disrupts the job market. So I suspect the hikes that Powell still got in place coming up and the, the trailing lagged effect of the previous hikes, you are going to see job losses um, next year, but I don't think it's going to be enough that triggers a significant recession. So um, I, I don't think Powell's going to have to cut next year. So I think he'll hike sit on his hands um, and let the previous um, hikes he's done take uh, effect and uh, kill some of the demand, which will keep inflation on a downward trajectory. But I don't think he's going to be hiking and then immediately cutting right afterwards. I think the bond market's trying to be a bit too cute, pricing in hikes and then immediately following with cuts. Um, I think he'll just sit on his hands, let things play out. And uh, so um, bond markets right for the first half. I think they're wrong about pricing cuts in the second half. Okay. And so if you're right, then we have a 50 basis points in December, another one sort of like in Q1 of next year, that gets to 5% Fed yep. fund rates. Is that going to be sufficient to sort of create some real turbulence in the sort of corporate credit market? Because if you do, you're going to see more defaults. I don't think 
It's going to trigger defaults. I think that keeps the recession mild and um, companies are still cash rich um, unless we go into a significant downturn. <clears throat> I don't expect a, a, a spike up in defaults in America. Um, the one area I was worried about defaults was manufacturing in Europe, excuse me. <laughs> but um, what I was worried about was that companies wouldn't be able to get access to the energy or would have to pay crazy prices to get electricity. But the mild start to the winter, buildup of storage of natural gas, really mitigating some of the most uh, extreme risks I was worried about in the summer. So um, defaults, there, in a recession, there's always defaults, but I don't think there's going to be a big wave of defaults. Um, it's not going to be anything like the financial crisis where banks were the epicenter and um, the whole failing of the, the financial system was a potential risk. I think this is more of a generic um, demand slowing type economic slowdown that shouldn't trigger a lot of defaults. So I think you're being compensated quite well um, to buy credit. I would stick to investment grade and particularly the banks. I think that offers the best risk-adjusted return in 2023, buying short-dated bank bonds. And uh, financial crisis is still in everyone's memory, and that's really where the risk was in the last um, wave of defaults. But regulation's so much better. Banks are so much better capitalized, and um, governments aren't going to let their banks fail. They've shown that. So um, it's never risk-free anytime you're taking credit, but it's pretty low risk. And the, the premium you're getting above uh, treasuries is pretty good. So you can buy Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and get almost 2% above uh, the two-year treasury yield right now. And uh, I think that's very attractive risk-adjusted return. Yeah, because of the sound balance sheets. Now, actually, I was just looking at one of your one of your shorts is Credit Suisse, which I can't yeah. understand because the, the they just raised, uh, I think it was four billion pounds on the sort of equity side, but they they also raised a bond about two or three months ago at twelve percent. So yeah. I guess they've got a shaky. They, they, they don't fit the sort of like rock solid balance sheet type. Of well, I, I actually buy Credit Suisse bonds. I don't think they're going to default, but I think they're going to dilute equity holders um, to make sure they don't default. So. Um, it's something I love the returns of the, the bonds I'm getting with Credit Suisse. I own it in all my multi-asset portfolios, but I'm short the stock just because equities are being diluted to make sure the capital positions are strong enough to make sure the bonds never default. So I actually think that's one I'm totally comfortable to own the bonds. Um, I own the senior bonds. I wouldn't own the subordinated bonds because those can be turned into equity. But uh, yeah, incredible um, yields that I still think are very safe, even though I'm short the equity. Mm. No, actually, I've heard of quite a few really smart investors also sort of like deciding to give up on equity and buy the bonds instead yeah. <laughs> because, because you get equity style returns from, from much higher um, assets further up the capital structure. Yeah. How does, um, how does the, the um, sort of co uh, quantitative tightening play into it, though? Into the, I mean, obviously not so much in Europe, but more into sort of like the States. And I know the Bank of England wants to roll off some of its balance sheet as well because you are starting to see now that a lot of... A lot of uh, sort of corporates are struggling to be able to even raise debt at reasonable levels. Um, quantitative tightening has been a big part of the story of 2022. Um, it's going to continue to be a story in 2023, um, but it's not really creating the tightening part of quantitative tightening. It's just removed massive amount of excess liquidity. So the Federal Reserve's gone from buying trillions of um, government mm. bonds, mortgage-backed securities. Now it's actively selling them. <laughs> And it's created a normal environment where equity multiples are now normal, bond yields are now pretty normal. If you buy treasury inflation protected securities, you're getting a return above inflation. Whereas this time last year, you had negative real yields. So it's led to double digit 20% sell-offs in assets just to get them back to normal valuations. So it's actually not an atypical environment we're in right now, where actually you do get compensated to take some term risk. If you go longer duration, um, you're getting yields that are higher mm. than expected inflation right now. And and that's pretty normal. It's not what we've been used to in recent years, but that's a, a normal functioning bond market, in my opinion. Yeah. And I guess, especially, I suppose, if you've got sort of like um, a bit of sort of quantitative tightening, it may not cause the credit cycle, but that's, <clears> that, that'll fit in with your sort of like view of um, earnings estimates for next year, because that will increase their cost of capital and their interest charges, I guess. Yeah, it's um, there's a lot of headwinds towards <clears throat> earnings and profit margins, interest rate expenses going to go up, um, ability to pass costs on to consumers, I think is going to be a lot more difficult next year. Mm. and 
it's we've had the big move in yields so so i think yields keep grinding higher next year um the long end i'm talking about and um i think we'll probably end the year with a pretty flat yield curve instead of the big inversion we've got right now so uh I don't have steepeners on, but I think that is going to be a big trade to put on next year as the 10 year yields start to price in stickier, not really high inflation, but higher than central bank target inflation. Mm. And um, the market stops pricing in any hikes um, from the Fed uh, once we do see the economy slow down to a level where it's flirting with recession. Yeah, I think, yeah, it seems to be quite a consensus trade to go sort of short term debt. And, um, and and hope that the, at some point in time, the Fed or the, or the central banks do sort of start reducing interest rates because that will bring the short end. Now, just look, looking in some sort of preferred um, sort of overweight <laughs> sectors, and we'll step through them in, in sort of like, you know, we've got energy, agriculture, healthcare, and luxury. So let's just start with energy. And that's say you've got sort of like, you can be sure of Shell, and you've got also the uranium guys, um, Cameco. Yeah, um, those four sectors you just mentioned, this, the theme there is companies and sectors that can defend their profit margins. So that's the big risk in 2023 is that margins are going to really be compressed. It's going to be bad at the aggregate index level. But all four of those sectors, I think, have the ability to defend profit margins and deliver really good profits next year. So um, where most companies will be guiding lower, I think these kind of sectors can meet and beat expectations. Yeah. So with energy, <clears throat> oil prices the exact same price they were <clears throat> excuse me this yeah time it is, last it's bizarre year. that isn't it it's <laughs> the same the oil price hasn't really sort of moved if you if you look at it from the beginning of january the first to now it, it's yeah. almost identical it is and it's had a, a really big moves in there but uh we're at a place where energy companies are incredibly profitable when oil's at 75 dollars a barrel they're pretty profitable at 60 dollars a barrel at 50 dollars a barrel not so much but it's Every day that oil stays anywhere near these levels, it's incredible cash flow for oil and gas companies. So um, the market's pricing in, in my opinion, on the equity side of things, a, a quick return to uh, $50 oil. And I don't think it happens. Um, every day, inventories are drawn down right now. So even with the oil prices falling 30% over recent months during that whole period, there's not been as much supply of oil as there has been demand for oil. So um, demand may further deteriorate. But if China reopens, if it ends its zero COVID policies, if the US economy doesn't fall into a meaningful recession, um, there could be meaningful demand growth next year as well. So um, I definitely like to own oil and gas companies because of the cash flow they're producing. And they're going to cause a margin squeeze everywhere else um, if energy prices do stay elevated. So it's a bit of a hedge against the broader index that if input prices do stay high, um, you want to own the companies that are creating those higher input prices. So um, oil and gas, um, uranium. Just on, that, just on that oil and gas, before we move to the uranium, obviously you've got the EU, which is just banned or just in the process of banning Russian oil and gas, you know, full stop, even the sort of the downstream products. I mean, it's got two effects, obviously. One, it means that it's going to tighten up the whole market, certainly uh, ocean going um, in terms of the uh, in terms of oil and gas, but also the sort of on the distillate side, diesel, I guess if you buy, if you get an integrated oil like Shell, which has got sort of refining capacity, that's mm -hmm. going to, you'd have thought the crack spreads also are going to be able, going to be, so that, that their refiners are really going to be going hell for leather to get as much distillate out to, to, to people as possible. Yeah, you should think they win on both sides, um, the integrated mm. companies from refining margins as well as um, their downstream and the upstream, upstream. Side, side of things. Um, if you think sticky oil prices. So, um, yeah, I like all aspects of energy. The integrateds, I think, produce massive cash flow. Um, probably I prefer them to ENPs right now just because um, – the dividends, the share buybacks, and uh, pretty attractive valuations and uh, benefiting potentially from uh, really great pricing on the, the refining side of things. Yeah. Uh, in terms of sort of windfall taxes, I mean, uh, lots of governments have said they want to tax these guys to the hill, but they're, they're a bit sort of cautious to do that because yeah. they, they, they it, sort of spike their nose to, to sort of feed themselves. Strategic reserves and having energy mm. independence, um, you don't really want to uh, kill the golden goose. So if you are mm. uh, really putting measures in place that are going to stop exploration and development of oil and production and building refining, um, all governments know they need them. Um, but it's a nice soundbite 
by to talk about a windfall tax. So the ones that are put in place have no teeth. Um, a politician can say that it's out there and everyone claps um, for that, but uh, it's not really impacting the oil companies. And that's my my view is that's probably how it stays, especially yeah. with oil prices now that they are down a lot from where they were earlier in the year too. So oil price is still elevated, but not as at eye watering levels anymore. Mm. And on the uranium side, I mean, it does seem as though the nuclear power industry is just going through a renaissance because we're trying to get, we've got small form uranium, sorry, small form nuclear power sort of generators, plus the old ones are continuing for longer and we're extending the life of a lot of them as well. So so, so take us through the, the Cameco because I've never really come across it before, but it's a sort of miner and explorer and processor of uranium. Yeah, so it's got the largest amount of uranium reserves in North America um, and Nuclear has to be part of the answer for everybody, basically. Um, you can't rely on Russian oil. Um, where oil is produced, there's always going to be geopolitical risks where access to supply um, may not be there the way it has been in the past. And uh, uranium fills a, a carbon neutral type thing as well. So uh, governments that want to go green, um, nuclear um, has risks, obviously, but it doesn't produce the carbon. And... Um, yeah, China needs it. Europe needs it. Um, North America needs it. It's not going to be the answer for everything, but it's part of a holistic view to create some energy independence for um, the Western world. So I, I do think there's going to be government policies and tailwinds um, really reinvigorating um, nuclear um, going forward, where after uh, Tokyo or after Japan, I mean, uh, the nuclear incident there, Germany really moved away from it. And I think they're they're being forced back to where the whole Western world's really going to want nuclear to be part of the answer. Good. And then just moving now to the agricultural side, what's the sort of like the, the thesis on that? You mentioned sort of protecting um, sort of margins <laughs> and uh, profits for next year, but obviously these are soft commodities. So we've got John Deere, Archer Daniels and uh, Corteva as well. I think Corteva is more of the seed side. Or, yeah, and Mosaic. Yeah. Those are the, the four mosaic, companies yeah. we've got. So yeah, we've got about... 14% of our global portfolio is in agribusiness equities. I think we're in an environment where there's global warming, climate change, and you've got droughts wiping out crops in some areas. You've got floods wiping out crops in other areas, and you've got um, agricultural commodity prices that aren't as high as they were right after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but still at elevated levels that are really incentivizing farmers to farm every acre of arable land they have. And, um, that's going to require more intensive farming, more pesticides, more fertilizers, um, more farm equipment, and they'll have the cash flow to buy these things. So I, I think this is a sector that will have pricing power next year. Um, consumers are going to have difficult choices to make next year, but eating is going to be on the top of everybody's list. And mm -hmm. um, when you do have potential disruptions that create spikes, um, I, I think these companies will have pricing power as well. Um, and Archer Daniels Midland, you mentioned, that's a company that does grain trading as well as a big part yeah. of their diff business. So um, buying crops in one area, immediately selling them somewhere else where the curve is a little bit better or the future is a better price. Um, that's a nice way to capture some volatility in uh, agricultural commodities as well. Is there any political risk in agriculture in terms of, you know, it's obviously it's a, food is such a sort of like... Uh, sort of, you know, uh, flashpoint for uh, for voters and for, for politicians and stuff. Is there any danger? I know it hasn't really been a, a sort of political sort of problem before, but you never know. It's a good question. And I've not thought about it too much because it's not really been on the agenda, but I suspect any political maneuvering would probably lead to higher grain prices for the most part because mm. um, you're probably curtailing exports somewhere, things like that, and that'll create... Um, um, higher prices somewhere else. So um, it's um, not something that seems to be on the agenda right now, but I think it may end up being a tailwind rather than a headwind for some of these yeah. companies. Yeah, I know in Asia, you occasionally get these sort of export bans, don't you, from places like India and uh, and places like that who won't, you know, but, but, but yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. Yeah. Now, uh, healthcare, obviously, really defensive sector. And I see you've got some sort of like, you know, best in class um, stocks. You've got AstraZeneca, Pfizer, obviously a beneficiary of, of COVID. And you've got McKesson, I think, who'll do with the big distributors out in the States of all sort of prescription drugs and OTC products, et cetera. Do you want to take us through the sort of, the, again, the, the sector, how you see it? Because obviously there's a lot of Democrats sort of taking, the, the, the putting it in the crosshairs, but they can never get the pricing uh, sort of regime sorted. Yeah, so it's, um, you always have regulation and uh, government at risk with this sector, but um, 
Novo Nordisk is one you didn't mention. And oh, Bosch, yeah, we, those are two other ones that I'm yeah. really positive on. So I like it. In an environment where you've got a slowing economy, you defensive characteristics in terms of cash flow, um, inelastic demand for pharmaceuticals and healthcare, um, the aging population, all of those things, I think, serve the sector well. Um, COVID was the big issue in previous years. Um, Novo Nordisk, I think, has the, the suite of drugs that are for the, the new epidemic or pandemics, even if it spreads beyond uh, yeah. the Western world. Diabetes, Ob yeah. yeah. Obesity yeah. and diabetes. It's uh, something that... Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it's a big issue for us. And um, Novo Nordisk, I think, is very well placed there. Cancer, oncology, um, there's real innovation there um, and potential blockbuster um, new therapeutics coming out. So um, I like the cash flows based on pipelines of all of these companies today. And there is potential big wins in the future as well as science is always improving. So. Um, it's a, a sector that's slightly expensive is the only problem with it. It's not very expensive, but uh, I think that I'm compensated for that with the, the predictability of the cash flows and the potential upside beyond consensus numbers as well. Uh, yes, that's quite interesting sort of like, you know, point you raise in terms of sort of pricing as sort of you know, for quality or paying up for, for quality. Now, I mean, AstraZeneca is one of my favorites as well. It's sort of like, you know, that huge oncology franchise. It comes out with sort of IP, sort of like um, clearances from a lot of the healthcare regulators almost every every day. And it's um, and it's immunotherapy type uh, yeah. treatments and stuff. But it's trades on sort of like 17 times next year's earnings, which actually, as I say, is quite high compared to a lot of the rest of the sector. But so, so how, how do you sort of like, you know, price in that sort of the extra quality in terms of? Yeah, it's, um, it's hard to do it at exact. Um, yeah. I just say that it's worth a premium. I think the MSCI world traditional multiples around 15. So 18 doesn't seem eye watering for me. If um, companies get up into the 30s, I, I do think about them a little bit more. But uh, compared to the FTSE, which is at 10 times earnings, it's obviously a very expensive sector. But uh, versus the whole world, it's a global company. Um, it's not a multiple that's um, crazily high. Um, no. Healthcare stocks, slightly expensive, but uh, definitely worth the price in this kind of uh, unclear um, economic environment. <clears throat> yeah. No, I think also say so with, with, with AstraZeneca, I think the, uh, the earnings are, suggest – a sort of like forecast for the next five years to go up by 15 to 20 percent so actually your peg ratio is is about one actually for a top quality healthcare so yep. uh, i can understand that one now um just in terms of the battleground sectors now that the, 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 the chips so the chip sector seems to be sort of like always in the sort of like the the crosshairs of a lot of sort of the uh, the, the 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 financial channels and, and I, I noticed you you stick with the um amsl for on the equipment side but recently yep. sold the the chip um the chip AMDs. Do you want to take us through your thesis on that? How you see sort of like um, yeah, microchips? So ASML, it's um, not a monopoly position, but it's almost in the monopoly mm. position. For the high-end lithography, it really has competitive advantages. So this is a company that I do think has the pricing power, will be able to defend its margins. Um, demand for its uh, equipment is much higher than the ability of it to provide it. So we've stuck with ASML, sold AMD, um, this chips and shipping were my two calls that I got wrong in 2022. Um, I really thought they would have more pricing power than they've had mm. and freight rates have plummeted. Um, semiconductors went from, uh, way more demand than there was supply and the supply demand got into balance very quickly, um, as the year progressed. So AMD is much more consumer centric. Um, it's mm. driven by consumer demand. And I think, um, the consumer is going to have a lot of difficulty in disposable income next year. So um, we've stuck with ASML, but uh, reduced the exposure by selling AMD last month into yeah. a bit of a rally. So, um, yeah, it's been a pretty terrible year for the chip companies, but October, November has been really strong for them. Yeah. What's your thought of thoughts going forward? I know it's a bit more medium to longer term, but you've got a lot of governments now deciding that they're going to build out their chip capacity. So you see it in sort of big plants like Intel and uh, TMSL in TMSC in in the US and stuff and you've got likewise got big investments being almost like encouraged in Europe as well is there a danger here that actually the chip sector goes from being sort of like you know high margin to sort of real quite commodity stuff in terms of three or four years time but the but the but your your equipment manufacturers your AMSL we're gonna have a boom time that's ex yeah I think uh, you summed it up perfectly is what my view is that uh, the 
the capital spend and building it up, the uh, manufacturing and processing of these things. I think it's got years ahead of us, um, but um, the end chips themselves, they're not completely commodity, but the low end chips are commodities at this point and you have no pricing power. The high end, the NVIDIAs, um, they are uh, very unique um, in their uh, positioning. So it's uh, it's got into balance much quicker than I expected. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the nature of things. You go from uh, oversupplied to undersupplied, and then uh, you you build out spending, and then you get back to oversupplied again. So it's a real risk. It's something yeah. uh, definitely to consider. Yeah, I, I actually just sold um, Infineon Tech on the same basis, actually. So uh, mm. I followed your approach. Now, uh, just on, on the luxury side, you talked about the consumer and the health could be struggling. But one area is obviously the people who have got well healed and lived in Knightsbridge and seem to be doing pretty well. And you've got um, Hermes and uh, uh, LVMH, etc. Yeah. Now, that's an amazing stat that they're sort of like the handbags for Hermes. They're going at sort of like your exclusive ones are going for about sort of $400,000 on, on auction. So can you just take us through sort of like both of those? Why, why they've got so much sort of margin and uh, earnings protection in next year? Yeah, so Hermes, if you uh, buy a, a $2,000 scarf from Hermes, their input costs are nothing for that, basically. So if input mm -hmm. prices double on that, it's still irrelevant to Hermes' profit margin, whereas a company like Next, H&M, um, with a 40% margin, when input prices grow, that can destroy all of their margin quite quickly. So it's um, the markups lead to very strong margins, makes them immune to higher input prices, and the mass consumer is facing difficult decisions, higher mortgage rates, higher utility bills, petrol prices, and uh, maybe even job security um, as we get into uh, next year. So they're going to have difficult decisions, but the high-end luxury consumer, these things are almost immaterial to them. So I don't think they've really changed their spending power. And um, that's what really attracts us to the high-end luxury consumer for mm -hmm. next year while we're shorting more mass market consumers that will see their margins decimated and uh, probably even revenue uh, hits next year. Right. And, and LVMH is, is essentially the champagnes of guys, I guess. And uh... Oh, they're diversified. If you want one luxury yeah. company, it's LVMH. Um, it's everything, basically. And um, I think uh, Bruno's just passed uh, Elon Musk is the richest man on the planet. And uh, Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> so I the, think... The... He's going to add a little bit more space between him and Elon next year. Yeah, the business model is certainly doing well. Now, just turn again to some battleground areas. We've got sort of consumer sort of like, they used to be high tech, but we've got PayPal, obviously, FinTech, as everybody knows, used to be part of um, of eBay. So we've got PayPal and eBay, the sort of, in, you know, the sort of the, they used to be one company, but they're separated into two. And so eBay is now the online marketplace and, and PayPal does all things sort of like, you know, um, transferring money. Do you want to take us through those? Because the, the shares have come down remarkably far. In fact, I would say, I mean, eBay's on just over 10 times next year's earnings. Um, I know it was a COVID beneficiary, and um, but but it's a cost of living crisis beneficiary as well, you'd have thought. And, and, and PayPal's on, so just uh, well, about 16 times earnings, et cetera. Yeah. So we own PayPal. We don't own eBay. Um, oh, we sorry. Had eBay last year, but we've, we've sold that one, um, moving away from uh, consumers. Um, but PayPal is one we stuck with. Um, it was up at $300 a share. We bought it yes. at $70 a share in, I think it was June. It went up to $100. Um, we still own it. It's back down to $70 again. Um, mm. So it is at risk with the consumer, um, but it is at a multiple that is way below its traditional multiple. So it is still a company that's exposed to the consumer, comes with risks. Um, I don't mind this kind of multiple it's at right now. And um, I don't think the consumer is dead. I just think it's going to uh, make difficult choices. It's still going to be purchasing things. And I think it's the retailers who are going to suffer, whereas the, the payment mechanisms, I think they have uh, less um, pressures on their margins. Um, their margins is basically fixed, and I don't think they're going to face pressures. It's going to be the merchandisers who are selling things that are facing the pressure. So that's one part exposed to the consumer, but I think they have a more defendable margin than uh, mass retail. How do you identify something like with, with pay, PayPal between a sort of like a, a value player and a value trap? Because um, it, it, it has all the hallmarks as being a still growing business and sort of like, you know, high profit margins, but it is on a value multiple and it has come down. I mean, it, it sort of like does raise a few eyebrows. 
Yeah, it's something I'm not um, sure will be a winner for me, but I'm happy to pay this multiple, <laughs> take the chance. Um, yeah. It Maybe I should have sold it when it jumped to 100 and I made 50%, but I've lost that all in recent months. I do think it's something that will get back to triple digits, though. I think it'll maintain this kind of multiple. I don't think it's going to go back to an extreme growth multiple because it is a, a cyclical company. It does have exposure to the consumer. Um, if you can pick it up in the teens, I think that's an attractive multiple. If it moves into the the mid twenties or low twenty multiples, I think that's probably where I'll be looking to. Uh, that's probably about a fair value for it. So I think it'll it'll hover between based on moments of exuberance and pessimism. Right now, I think it's being priced on a bit of pessimism. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, this sort of territory, it's not out of the question that somebody like Amazon buys it or even, even you know, sort of Elon Musk decides to open a check and have that super app or something like that. Because, uh, I mean, PayPal, presumably, you avoid all the interconnect fees from Visa and MasterCard when you Yeah, use it. it's um, meant to disrupt them. I actually own Visa as well. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. Um, so I'm... <laughs> I like to have my fingers there on both of these side of things because they, they do have uh, pricing power and they are, regardless of what the consumer is spending on, that they're yeah. paying for it with Visa <clears throat> or a PayPal and um, it's pretty resilient business models. And uh, yeah, it could be a takeover candidate. It's not part of my thesis, but yeah. uh, stranger things have happened for sure. Yeah. Now moving on to sort of takeover candidates, you've got um, Activision Blizzard in the portfolio, yeah. and obviously that has got a bid from Microsoft. It's going through all the competition clearances, and I, and I think so. I've heard, seen notes that they're hoping to actually finalise and close the deal mid twenty twenty three. The shares are trading at about seventy five dollars, and the the bid price or the agreed um, offer price is ninety five. Yeah. So, how have you sort of like priced all that sort of risk of it going forward and not going forward? Because I mean, there's big discount that twenty dollars. A- it is. I'm surprised how big it is. Microsoft, everything that I've read, they do seem to want this to go through, and mm. that means if they're willing to make concessions, um, they'll get it through. Um, anytime Microsoft does anything, there's always going to be regulatory reviews. Um, the, the legal teams I've talked to from different sell side firms, they think it should get through as long as Microsoft has the will to, and and they seem to. Um, it's also uh, on a standalone basis. There's other companies that it would be potential bidders for it should the Microsoft deal um, not be approved or should Microsoft decide to walk away. Um, probably not $95 a share, but I don't think there's a lot of downside from where it is right now because um, other companies would want to... Uh, expand their content basically um gaming's a big part of content everybody um online media um even a company like netflix um, moving into gaming things like that there's potential other buyers for it as well so my base case is we get the 95 dollars a share in the middle of next year but i don't think there's massive downside for it um, when mm-hmm. we're below 80 dollars a share right now either yeah, I did actually see on the headlines that Dan Ives from Wedbus Securities had backed the deal and said it was an absolute raging surge. So that's probably the kiss of death to it, Uh-oh. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait and see anyway. But it does seem a strange uh, anomaly when it comes to sort of the pricing, a bit like um, Twitter when they had uh, that yeah. bid with, with Elon Musk because that, 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 that increased a, a lot as well. Yeah, that's one Elon didn't want to go through, but he was pretty much committed to yeah. make it go through. So Microsoft probably could get out of this one just because of the regulatory issues, but uh, they definitely seem keen to want to close yeah. this. So um, yeah, my base case is deal gets done. Yeah, it's a trophy asset. Now, just just going through a few short positions, you've got um, BT Group in there, which um, is an odd one. I mean, that's trading a, a, re- a real value trap um, sort of value rating. It's on about sort of six times PE and about eight times um, EBIT multiple. It's got a huge, um, well, pretty significant debt pile and an even bigger pension issue, hasn't it, I guess? but uh, what, Debt and pensions, of- yeah. that's In a slowing economy, you don't want to have a, a very levered company um, and uh, interest rates are going higher. That's a big burden for BT. Um, pension deficits and another big burden. So it's something that I don't, I'm not scared about this stock shooting higher. I do think mm. if it... Uh, if it moves higher, it's not going to be in a, a sharp move. I don't think anyone can take out BT. Um, it's pretty intense competition, even though it is a bit of an oligopoly, I guess, UK telecoms and internet. There's enough competition that no company is able to make any excess profits. Yeah. And then just when it comes to sort of, so 
when it comes to sort of the valuation of it and, and putting the short on, I mean, I'm with you. It, I mean, the shares haven't moved for like 10 years almost. Mm. They've stayed at about 120. And they've got obviously a lot it's of... The FTSE uh, as a whole, I think, is probably... Yeah, no, you're probably well, 20 years. Yeah, exactly. But I guess if their cost of capital is going up on the debt side and probably also on the, on the pension, that means all things being equal, if the valuation of the company doesn't go up, the equity portion has got to decrease, hasn't it, just by the maths? Exactly, yeah. If the enterprise value is pretty static and um, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a difficult environment uh, for BT. So it is uh, cheap, but this is one I'm viewing as a value trap. And uh, yeah. I've been on the long side of value traps enough to know um, that uh, <laughs> things that look cheap aren't always uh, good investments. Yeah, no, it pays a ridiculously high yield as well. Yeah. Now, um, Boeing's another one which is short on. This is uh, one I've lost on, actually. So um, Boeing, year to date, we've we've not really lost on it, but uh, compared to the market, it's had a big run up. So I've had this on all year. It's been a really good short until the last mm. few months. Um, it's got issues with the 737, but um, it's one I'm sticking with. It doesn't generate earnings, and... Um, it's a company that has a lot of assets. It has potential to generate earnings. I don't think we're going into the macro environment where it's really going to be able to unlock earnings. So it's um, a company that could be cheap if it really gets everything into place. But um, right now, it's not. And um, until it's generating free cash flow um, at a significant yield, that's when I'd want to buy Boeing. So um it's one that, uh, yeah, it's not been a, a good performing short for me um, anymore because I should have closed it out two months ago as it got probably too cheap. But uh, I don't think the macro environment's really going to uh, favor Boeing right now. Mm. I think there's a big um, binary event as well, isn't there, coming up in a, in a week or a couple of weeks because the, uh, the, the US um, aviation regulators are deciding whether they're going to be able, they're going to allow Boeing to, um, to certify their, uh, their MAX, aren't they, after... And that there's a deadline of two years or something which comes up. Yeah, and I I don't know if that's going to be a big thing because I think there'll be extensions and things. So I don't know if it's a right, drop dead okay. date anyway. But uh, yeah, I think that's how it's being presented at, at times. But I I don't think it's going to be this. It's either approved or not. Um. Then. Okay. Now, just turning to the metaverse because we've obviously it's uh, it, it's upturned um, uh, Facebook or uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and the one one short you do have is Roadblocks, which is I think is still the sort of the one of the largest sort of like you know metaverse type uh, stocks. Yeah. Fifty million daily daily acts with users, etc. But it's not profitable. I think it's coming up to sort of like um, cash flow positive, well, break even for next year. But it is still trading on the seven times um, sort of sales multiple. Yeah, exactly. It's a sort of the darling of the metaverse, I suppose. Um, it, um, it's a company that uh, I think it's going to have real difficulty uh, monetizing its position in uh, the, the, the world. Basically, it's, it can attract users. It's got a business model that attracts uh, users, creates revenue growth, but uh, free cash flow is not there. Earnings are a long way off. So it's um, in a higher yield environment. It's the kind of company that... I'm comfortable to bet against basically um, companies that are trading at very high price to sales multiples. Mm. Um, I like to have some of the, that kind of exposure because when the market does go down and risk aversion goes up stocks at these kind of multiples generally give you disproportionate returns when the market does sell off. Yeah. And then just finally on, on just a couple of others, we've got, um, again, they're real sort of like battle, battleground stocks. So sort of, I've heard CNBC guys go talking about as value plays, but uh, what is Paramount, which obviously has, has got, is, is doing its investing in its online and um, D2C business. And then we've also got Kinder Morgan, which I think is a pipelines business on the energy side in, in the US. Yeah, it's. Um, I like to pair some of my longs and my shorts. Mm. So I've got the oil and gas. It's my biggest overweight on the long side of things. So um, Kinder Morgan, it um, does face more regulatory risk, I think, than um, the broader EMPs and the integrated companies. And it does reduce some of my exposure. So it's an expensive company. doesn't produce the, the same kind of cash flows. Um, it's not buying back shares as uh, aggressively or as... Uh, uh, the same kind of share back yield you know, that you get in the NP and the integrated, you don't get that with these kind of companies. So I'm sure that one. It's got a massive amount of debt, actually, isn't it? It's it four, does. It's four it, times EBITDA. It's um, 
it's asset backed, so you can be comfortable with the debt, but it is a risk. Um, if I'm wrong on the oil prices and uh, things do go south for the sector as a whole, um, mm -hmm. companies with a lot of gearing, um, they can dis fall disproportionately um, compared to some of the other companies that have been paying down debt more aggressively. Yeah. And what about Paramount? So now that's got a quite a bit of debt as well, hasn't it? It does, exactly. So um, owning content is uh, very important, I think. And that's something that in the long term, uh, companies that produce content, that's probably much more important than distribution of that content mm -hmm. in terms of monetizing it. Um, but um, the amount of debt it's got, um, the, the capital expenditures it's got to do to get its distribution right, um, for me, that's something we're short right now. Um, long term, I think it's probably going to be a reasonable stock. But I think in the coming months, as uh, the cash flows it's spending and the, the debt costs go up, it is a, a valuation risk. Yeah. And then just finally, is there anything we're just keeping you up at night for, for next year? I mean, I'm guessing the, the increased volatility is probably quite good for your strategy, sort of like picking winners both short and the long side. Mm, it's been a pretty good year for us. Very that, good. Uh, yeah, it's, um, we've done well, but it's, yeah, it's never comfortable with this volatility <laughs> because it's <laughs> something that's going incredibly well. It turns really quickly. So um, it doesn't keep me up at night, but it's uh, been a market where we've eked out relative returns on what we've bought. So we outperformed the MSCI world mm. by a couple of percent on what we bought long. Um, our shorts did really well this year. So our shorts are up 23% year to date yeah. versus the MSCI world that's down about 15% year to date. So um, yes, it's not been a, an easy ride this year. Um, there's been lots of things we got right, lots of things we got wrong. We got a little bit more right than wrong. And um, that, that's all you can hope for in this kind of market, I suppose. Yeah, well, you've certainly demonstrated a lot of alpha this year. So um, I think your investors will be delighted. What about, actually, just what about um, the currency markets? I mean, it does seem as now the consensus is the dollar's going to weaken. And some people are actually saying sterling's going to strengthen, which, frankly, I just can't see. But what, what's your view on the sort of top-level currencies? I think the dollar is going to appreciate in 2023. Um, so I'm against uh, the consensus view that we're past peak dollar. And it's based on what we talked about at the very yeah. beginning of this segment is that uh, the market's pricing in the Fed cutting in the second half of next year. If the Fed doesn't cut, um, I think that leads to dollar strength because the market has the Bank of England and the ECB hiking in the second half of next year. I can't see any scenario where that happens at the same time as the Fed's cutting because the US economy is going to be stronger than Europe and Great Britain next year. To think that their central banks will be hiking while the Fed's cutting, I just think the market might be wrong on both of those. But uh, I it's it's hard for me to see how the Fed's cutting while the Bank of England and uh, the ECB are hiking. Um, there would be something strange that's happened to the U.S. economy. Um, that's it's hard to say. The market's definitely wrong, but um, I've got a high yeah. belief that that part of the thinking of the market is wrong right now. Good. Well, I must admit, I do. Uh, I do like the the contrarian views. That's for sure because there's too much consensus which goes on at the moment. People just sort of like cut and paste what the uh, the investment banks say. So, if people wanted to um, to invest in the fund, uh, Patrick, how best to do that? Is it sort of go through their advisors or um, what, what suggest? Um... So I buy my fund. It's called Prosper Global Macro. I buy it through AJ Bell. It's on platforms. Going through the advisors is a good way. Um, our long short certificates, um, we've got uh, UBS issuing versions of it um, as well. So going through your advisor is the best way, um, yeah. definitely. And uh, yeah, anyone who's got some interest, um, happy to uh, talk it through with anybody. Well, you've done a terrific job this last uh, 12 months. I mean, as I say, just look at the report. Just look at the returns. Absolutely fabulous compared to the rest of the market. So big pat on the back uh, for that Thank one, uh, Patrick. <laughs> and uh, I think you deserve a rest over Christmas and New Year. That's for sure. But, but I'm sure. We all think, do. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, but I think you're sort of so passionate about the markets. You'll probably be, be glued to them anyway. Well, there's going to be lots happening in... In December still, we've still got the BOE, the Fed, and uh, yeah, yeah and a busy CPI, next year. CPI next Tuesday. CPI as well, well yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much again for your time, uh, Patrick, and look forward to uh, touching base in six months' time. Sounds good. Thank you.